Welcome to the Human Experience Podcast, the only podcast designed to fuse your left and right brain hemispheres and feed it the most entertaining and mentally engaging topics on the planet. As we approach our ascent, please make sure your frontal, temporal and occipital lobes are in their full upright position. As you take your seat of consciousness, relax your senses and allow us to take you on a journey. We are the Intimate Strangers. Thank you for listening. Welcome to yet another episode of the Human Experience Live Show. Thank you guys so much for being here. We have a really great episode planned for you guys today. If you're listening to this on YouTube, please feel free to interact. Join our Discord and you can ask questions live to our guest there. My guest for you today, highly interesting content. His name is Dr. Steve Stewart Williams. Steve Stewart Williams is an author and researcher who delves into how the theories from evolutionary biology might help us understand our human behavior and culture. He attained his PhD in psychology and philosophy at Macy University in New Zealand and is an associate professor of psychology at Nottingham University at the Malaysia campus. Steve has written a number of books looking at evolutionary topics and conundrums. His latest book is called The Ape That Understood the Universe and How the Mind and Culture Evolve. Dr. Steve, it's a pleasure to have you on the show, sir. Welcome to HXP. Thanks very much. It's a pleasure to be here. So, wow, you know, I've got the book in my hand, The Ape That Understood the Universe. It's a really interesting perspective that you start with. You know, why don't you, st- why don't you kick us off by giving us a little bit of your background? How, how did you get into this work? Uh, well, so, so I'm originally a Kiwi, so let me just say that first. I'm a Kiwi. I'm from New Zealand originally. That's where my accent's from, if you're trying to place the accent. Um, so how did I get into it? Well, it was actually, I've always been interested in the kind of the big issues in science and philosophy, where we came from, why we are the way we are. Uh, the real turning point, though, was a pair of books. One of them was a book called The Moral Animal by Robert Wright, mm-hmm. which is about evolutionary psychology. And then a second one was a book uh, by Stephen Pinker called How the Mind Works. Uh, and those two books, they really got me into evolutionary psychology. The thing that really struck me is that the theories in evolutionary uh, psychology, the theories from evolutionary biology, are just very, very powerful. They have a, a lot of explanatory uh, a lot of explanatory power in terms of explaining human beings and human nature and and why we behave the way that we do and they're just really intellectually satisfying explanations okay okay so then you know it it seems like you took a very macrocosmic view on what it would look like to another civilization if they came to visit our planet and studied it right that's that's how you begin the book yeah, that's right. So I basically, the, the main gimmick of the book is that it starts with uh, the perspective of an alien scientist. I have a sort of hypothetical scientific article written by an alien scientist from the planet Betelgeuse 3, who comes from this really weird species that doesn't have males and females. They don't fall in love. They don't have families. Uh, they don't have music or art or reality TV or any, anything else like that. And I start by asking, so how would a being like that, completely different from us, how would it view our species? And the short answer is that it would just be very, very puzzled by our species. And it would just have a ton of questions about us. Um, it, would, it would want to know why do they come in two main forms, males and females? And why do the males and females differ from each other, but, but don't differ as much from each other as, for instance, male gorillas or male peacocks, male, male and female gorillas, peacocks, uh, deer, etc. cetera. Um, why do they fall in love? Um, why does love not always go smoothly? Uh, why do they get jealous? if the person they're in love with decides to get involved with somebody else? Uh, Why do they tend to look after their own children rather than the next door neighbor's children? Um, Why do they kind of hypnotize themselves with these uh, rhythmical sounds of, with differing pitches, sure, et cetera. Yeah. And I use that. So the point of that basically is to, to look at our species and to get the reader to look at our species anew as if for the first time and say, look at all the stuff you take for granted. Um, and it's come so naturally to you, you might not even think that it requires an explanation. All this stuff is kind of strange. It didn't have to be this way. Why is it this way? So, okay, so let's define evolution. How, how do you define evolution? Uh, well, evolution in, in the biological sense, it refers to a change in the frequency of genes within the gene pool. 
Um, and that, that's all it is, really. So it's, um, it's change over time. Uh, a key ingredient of evolution is natural selection. So you get natural selection uh, of genes within evolutionary biology. But you can actually also extend that into the cultural realm, and you get the, the natural selection of different kinds of cultural variants. Some do better than others, and, and that's what cultural evolutionary uh, theory looks at. I can tell you... So, sorry, go ahead. No, 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 go ahead, go ahead, please finish. Well, I'm just thinking, uh, I find one of the most useful ways to, to introduce evolutionary theory and, and how you can apply it to the mind and behavior is to think about how you apply evolutionary uh, principles to explaining the anatomical features in other animals. So, so one question might be, why do, why do lions have those big, sharp fangs? Okay, so, so why did those evolve? Why are they useful for the lion? Mm -hmm. And the answer, of course, is that they're, they're useful for catching prey. And sure. then for once the prey is caught, they're useful for devouring the prey. Uh, why do gazelles have really, really fast legs? Well, that's so that they can run away from the lions, run, run away from other predators. Now, what evolutionary psychology does is it takes that explanatory framework and it applies it to the human mind and to human behavior. So you might ask, for instance, why is it that if we haven't eaten for a while, we feel a sensation, this motivation called hunger? So why is that? And it's pretty clear, right? We have a, uh, this motivation because it pushes us and prompts us to go and get some food that we need to fuel our bodies and build our bodies. Mm. Now, the question might be, why do we have sexual desire? And the idea there, of course, is that it motivates certain kinds of behavior that throughout the, the bulk of our evolutionary history, in other words, before we invented birth control, reliably re resulted in offspring and we mm -hmm. pass on our genes that way. Parental care is another one. Um, why do we have this uh, love for our offspring? And that's because it, it motivates us to care for our offspring so that one day they can start this whole cycle all over again. Hmm. Okay, so so it's a matter of genes and their editing and you know reproduction. That's Is that the basis of what I'm looking at? Yeah. Uh, reproduction is about 95% of it for human beings. Um, it does also apply though Natural selection can favor traits that allow us to help relatives other than our offspring as well. So, so what it is about 100 percent of what it's about is is passing on our genes. So, selection favors traits that lead us uh, typically to pass on our genes. And the rationale for that is that if you imagine uh, any gene that came along that caused its owner to pass on its genes less reliably than its next door neighbor, well, that gene is soon going to evaporate from the gene pool, and, and we're just going to have left those genes that cause their owners to pass on their genes uh, reliably. Hmm. Okay, so so the, the alien anthropologist that came from the planet Betelgeuse, I mean, tell us a little bit more about what he would encounter, or he or she or it would encounter <laughs> when, it, when it, it encountered our species in this male-female regard. I mean, there, there's so much yeah. of a difference in culture with us because it evolves through time. I mean, this is what isolates humans from other creatures on the planet, right? It really is, yes. The really big difference between ourselves and basically every other animal on the planet, I think, is culture. Um, there are though some sort of biological consistencies that you do find across very, very different cultures. And, um, and sex differences are one of those. Um, if you like, maybe we could pick one out at random. Should we, we could maybe talk about sex differences and aggression. We could talk about how sure. uh, biology and culture interacts there. Because um, that's, I think it's quite an interesting case study, and okay. it would, I think, answer quite a few of the aliens' questions about ourselves and why we're like other animals in some ways, and why we're different in others. Okay. Um, and I guess the first thing to say there would be that there's, there's no doubt at all that culture and socialization and learning do affect the propensity to aggression, and they can magnify or minimize uh, the size of the sex difference in aggression. Probably the best evidence that culture is very, very important here is uh, the evidence documented by Stephen Pinker in his book, The Better Angels of Our Nature, uh, and also in his more recent one, Enlightenment Now. And he, he documents very convincingly that levels of violence have come down pretty steadily, some, some uh, ups and downs, but they come down pretty steadily over the last few decades, over the last centuries, over the last millennia as well. And that's not because of bio it's all happened too fast to be due to biological evolution. That has to be an example of a cultural change. We've managed to tame our aggressive instincts. Hmm. But there are reasons to think that there are aggressive instincts in the first place that we have to tame, various reasons. And, and one of those is just simply that we have brain mechanisms um, that, uh, that cause us to get angry in certain circumstances, give us a desire to lash out in certain circumstances. Um, but they don't force it, right? They, they give us a motivation to do that, but we can 
we can import into our heads cultural software that allows us to control that. Uh, things like uh, counting to 10 when you're angry is a very simple idea. Mm-hmm. Um, legal systems that incentivize not being uh, viciously aggressive at random and, and things like that. Uh, do you want me to, to say a little bit about sex differences and aggression, how we know that those are not just purely a product of culture? Yeah, let's go for it. Um, okay, so several lines of evidence. I guess one place to start with that would be the fact that you find the sex difference in basically every culture for which we've got good data. So if you look, for instance, at homicide records, most homicides are recorded. So we do have some pretty accurate uh, evidence uh, in that respect. And you find in every single country without fail, uh, homicide is overwhelmingly perpetrated by males. It tends to be around 90% is, is the global average. 90% of homicides uh, are due to men rather than women. Um, now, you might say, well, this is because men on average are stronger and men um, are larger. Maybe, maybe that's the reason. And that could be part of it, right? But actually, what you also find is that in most cultures, the culture actually tries to clamp down on male aggression and, th- and therefore to, in effect, reduce the size of the sex difference. And they do a lot more clamping down on male aggression than on female aggression, just simply because males are more aggressive. What you find, though, is that despite the culture pushing against male aggression, males are more aggressive anyway. Okay. So we have an example here of a sex difference that persists despite culture rather than because of culture. Uh, you also have prenatal hormonal correlates of aggression. So greater uh, testosterone in the womb seems to be associated with higher levels of aggression. Uh, what else? You, oh, and another, I guess, a very important one is that you find very, very similar things in, in other species. You don't find it in all other species, but importantly, you find it in other species uh, that are evolutionarily comparable to our own, that face similar selection pressures to our own. And, and one little heuristic is that in mammals, basically the sex that is larger, mm-hmm. which is usually the male, but the sex that is larger is also usually the more aggressive sex. And the larger the gap between the males and females, uh, the larger the sex difference in aggression and, and various other behaviors as well. Wow, that's fascinating. So you're saying that, like, among whales, it, it's different. Mm-hmm. The aggression level is based on how much larger the other the the sex of the male would or female would be. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. So, so the size of the sex difference. So, a really good example might be gorillas. Um, another example would be deer. And and both of those species, the males. Actually, I'll tell you what the very best example I think is actually elephant seals. So, so if your listeners are interested in, in Googling this, Google elephant seals. They're a really fascinating animal. Okay. And w- one thing that's really fascinating about them is that the males are about three or four times larger than the females. And that goes hand in hand with it, just a, a massive difference in terms of, of aggression. The males are vastly more aggressive than, um, than the females are. Now, you can tell the difference is a lot smaller in our species, that the size difference is a lot smaller. And along with the size difference, a lot of the psychological sex differences in our species are a lot smaller as well. We're, we're somewhat dimorphic, like we have uh, moderate sex differences, but they are, they're that. They're, they're just moderate rather than massive sex differences. Hmm. Okay. I mean, I'm intrigued by all of this information. So, I mean, I, I want to understand, I mean, why why did humans evolve faster than other animals? Is that the correct term, that we evolve faster? Um, I think that, I probably wouldn't put it that way, actually. Okay. I think um, the way that biologists would usually say that is that every species on the planet is equally evolved, because we've all been evolving uh, for the same length of time, okay. um, which is nearly 4 billion years. We're all, all nearly 4 billion years of evolutionary history. Um, now, we are certainly, we, we have certain traits that outstrip other animals. So we're more intelligent. We have a greater cultural capacity. We can do things like Skype each other from opposite sides of the planet like we're doing right now. And, and other animals couldn't possibly do that. We can go to the moon, et cetera, et cetera. The, the list is very long. Um, but although we outstrip them in those ways, that doesn't, doesn't mean we're more evolved. Um, it just means that we've, our evolution has gone in a different direction. So evolution, so, so like I mentioned right, it favors traits that allow us to pass on our genes. But there are just so many, many, many different ways of doing that. And, and different species uh, evolve in different directions to do that in different ways. So how, how do emotions come into play when we're talking about the evolution of a species on the planet? Uh, well, the main function of, of emotions uh, is to motivate behavior. So if you had a, an emotion that didn't actually cause any kind of behavioral effect, 
It couldn't have any evolutionary effect. It couldn't cause you to survive better or have more offspring or help your relatives to have more offspring. And it would therefore be uh, invisible to natural selection. So emotions motivate behavior. Um, so just like hunger motivates the desire to eat, uh, anger motivates certain kind of behavior, motivates uh, self-protective behavior often. Um, disgust motivates us to stay away from uh, things that might, like, like food that's gone off and would make us sick uh, or, or bacteria that might harm us. Uh, what other emotions? Some more complex ones as well, actually, uh, come into the mix. Right. So you, jealousy is one example. So, yeah. yeah, I was just about to go there. I apologize so much. Jealousy, yeah, I mean, worries. you bring up jealousy quite a bit. So like mate yeah. guarding, how does that work? Yeah, well, um, so mate guarding is the kind of behavior that jealousy motivates, right? So so jealousy, both sexes in our species are prone to jealousy. And at, at a very general level, it has the same function in both. So humans are a pair bonding species. We, we fall in love, we form pair bonds. And if children come in on the scene, we often engage in biparental care. Um, now, pair bonds are adaptive for both sexes. That's why both sexes fall in love. It's not just one or other sex that falls in love. That, that indicates that they're adaptive for both of us. And what jealousy does is it basically motivates behavior that leads us to protect the pair bond. So, uh, and that's called mate guarding. So we guard our mates and we try to retain our mates and we keep them happy. We try to keep them away from um, potential, uh, you know, individuals that might try to poach them away from us. Um, so that's, that's the, the main function. Now there are actually, there are some sex differences and when you look more specifically at the function of, uh, of jealousy and mate guarding, um, for men, it's mainly about, uh, paternity. So in, in uh, species like our own that have internal fertilization, uh, there's always a difference in that the females are more likely to end up investing in their own offspring than the males are. So in humans, for instance, uh, there's been no case in the entire history of the planet where a woman has given birth to a baby and then thought, hang on a minute, how do I know that this is my baby and not some other woman's baby? Right, right that's never happened. Right. Men, on the other hand, if, um, if their, their wife or their partner gives birth to a kid, that's probably their kid, but there's always some chance that actually it's some other guy's, uh, some other guy's kid. And if it is some other guy's kid, they're going to end up investing in genes that are not their own. And that, that trait is going to be selected against. Hmm. Basically, in that context, any trait that comes along, that means that the guy is more likely to, to look after his, his own kids than the kids of the good-looking next-door neighbor. Any trait that does that has a good chance of being selected. And jealousy is one such trait, right? So there's the kind of jealousy that makes men keep an eye on their partners or their, their wives, uh, keep an eye on the good-looking next-door neighbor, and try to do what he can to keep them apart. And any trait like jealousy, that any gene that comes along that creates that kind of trait, it's just automatically going to be copied into more new bodies mm -hmm. than a gene that inclines a guy to think, well, you know, I don't care. I, I'm, an, I'm an enlightened guy. I don't care if my, my wife sleeps with other dudes. <laughs> <laughs> so that's the male side of the equation. Now, for, for women, it's a bit different, though. So for women, the main purpose of jealousy relates to paternal care, so care from the father. And basically, throughout most of our evolutionary history, um, having, having sex reliably led to kids, and kids were a lot of work. And women, could, women couldn't really do it alone. And in that context, um, women who had an investing partner, a guy who is willing and able to look at, help them look after the kid, especially in the early years, well, they would do better and have more surviving offspring than, than women who didn't have that. And so just as jealousy is useful for men, it becomes useful for women as well to protect the pair bond, to try to um, get a good looking next door neighbor, if it's a woman, from, from poaching away uh, her mate. Because you want the couple to stay committed to the baby, that they're, the offspring that they're, they're raising. Exactly, at least in the short term. And, you know, our pair bonds in our species, they sometimes last for life. Uh, often they don't, though. Um, so, so most people fall in love more than once in their lifetime. So, I mean, how would you pay tribute to the stereotype that men are more fa in favor of casual sex? I mean, because this, it does happen. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, that is, that's a very widespread stereotype. 
uh, and I think the reason it's very wide, widespread is that it's true. Um, it, it is actually the case there are, there are average differences between men and women in terms of how interested they are in casual sex. Now, I should probably preface this by saying that so, so that doesn't mean that there are differences necessarily in terms of how interested they are in long-term relationships. And men and women tend to be pretty, pretty much similar in terms of how interested they are in long-term relationships. The differences really come when it comes to short-term relationships. Um, and the evolutionary logic behind this, people are pretty familiar with it, actually. It's quite well known these days. Um, I guess it's fair to say, though, that actually people sometimes get it a bit muddled up. Now, people think it's because sperm are less costly than eggs. And, and mm. men can produce many, many more sperm than women can produce eggs. It's actually not, not quite about that. It's actually about parental investment more generally. And basically women, uh, like mammals in general, um, women have a higher, what's called obligatory physiological investment in the young. So in other words, women are the ones that get pregnant and that's non-negotiable. Women are the ones that had to give birth to the kid, again, non-negotiable. Mm -hmm. And until recently, that they also would have had to um, breastfeed the kid. Now, now that's optional, but until very recently, that was obligatory as well. And on top of that, um, women in all cultures uh, invest more in the offspring in terms of direct hands-on childcare than men do, um, even today. Actually, you know, the, one of the big um, things that makes our species different from most mammals is that the, the men do invest as well quite a lot of the time. Um, but still, there is, a, there is a sex difference there. And the overall sex difference is that women invest more in offspring than do men. Now, as a result of that, it creates very different selection pressures on men and women. So if you imagine a guy, if he was to have, say, three sexual partners in a year, mm -hmm. potentially he could have three offspring at the end of that year. Sure. A woman, on the other hand, if she would have three uh, sexual partners in the course of a year, more than likely she's going to have no more offspring than she would if she only had one. And, and obviously other things come into it, but this would have created a selection pressure uh, on ancestral males throughout the course of our evolution for a stronger desire to seek out multiple partners and for a stronger desire for no strings attached sex, casual sex, in other words. Uh, and, and we do indeed see that. And in every culture where we have good evidence, uh, you do find that difference. So, so wait, let me get this right. So if you, if you had an island and you had 99 women and one male on that island, the one male could spread his seed to those 99 women and have potentially 99 offspring. But if you exactly. had 99 men and one woman on that island, that same, that a different island, then, I mean, the, the likely, there's, there's, there's all this competition now, right? Yeah, exactly. And she'd only be able to have one kid at the end of that time. And um, it's a really good example, actually, because that, that really makes the point very, very clear. So, so basically, the maximum number of offspring that a man can have is much, much higher than the maximum that a woman can have. It's, fasc it's really fascinating to look at the, the psychology aspect of this because it does work in. And I mean, you, when you were studying for this, you, you, I think we talked about in the pre-show that you – did you move to Malaysia to re do the research for this show? Or the, the uh, for the book, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so I started in New Zealand, and we then went to Canada, and I worked with two of the big names in evolutionary psychology, uh, Martin Daly and Margot Wilson. Um, then we lived in Wales for about six years, and then moved out here to Malaysia. Originally, that was just to be – I was on sabbatical to start work on, on the book. Um, and the ape that understood the universe. Uh, it actually turned out, though, that we really love living here. Um, the food's great, the weather's great, the people are great. And so we decided we wanted to stay. So that's how I got this job at the University of Nottingham. Okay, okay. So would you would you say that you are a hardcore scientist? Uh, I'd like to think I am, yeah. <laughs> I mean, what I mean to say by that is, I mean, how does religion play into this? Because, I mean, th there should be the, the God quotient, right? Uh, what's, the, what's the God quotient? I mean, do, do you believe in God? I, I don't know. Okay, so you're an atheist. And, and sorry, and so I, I'm an atheist, yeah. And that's I don't, comma, N-O, rather than I don't, K-N-O-W. Yeah. <laughs> okay, I understand. <laughs> and, so, and I'm guessing you do. You do, yeah. I would say I'm an agnostic. You know, I'm somewhere in sure. the middle somewhere. Yeah. Um, but, you know, religion does seem to play a really large role in the evolution of culture and our species. So how did you define that in the book? Um, well, in the book, I, I look at, for instance, um, how the concept of God um, might have evolved um, and how uh, religious moralities as well might have evolved. And there are a few ideas there. Um, one is that a lot of ideas that you get in religion 
uh, including the notion of, of what are called big gods. So, so gods like the Judeo-Christian god um, that um, they're like moralistic gods that watch everything we do and that reward us for good behavior, punish us for bad behavior. Mm-hmm. So, so one idea is that that was selected culturally, not, not genetically, but culturally, because any group that had those kind of ideas, those kind of memes, uh, did better because people behaved better. Now, in, in small groups, like the groups we spent most of our evolutionary history in, um, you don't really need those kind of incentives to behave well, because everybody knows everybody else, and we kind of keep each other in line um, with just everyday, um, you know, approval of other people's behavior, disapproval of their bad behavior. But when, when groups get too big, you need other kind of things to keep us in line. Uh, and the idea here is that big gods evolved culturally for that purpose. Um, they cause people to behave well, even when actually they probably could get away with it in, in large anonymous societies. They could get away with bad behavior, but they have in the back of their mind that there are these big gods watching them, and so they do less of that. Uh, that's one idea. And another idea is the idea that God is is kind of like a, a catchy meme. Mm. So, you know, airworms, right? The concept of airworms? No, please, um, please explain. Oh, okay, so, so those are like, uh, you might not know the, the word, but you definitely know what they are. They're basically annoyingly catchy tunes. Right, that oh, okay, stick yeah. in our mind. Sure, sure. So, and they persist in the culture, not because they're good for us, not because they're good for the group as a whole, but just because they're catchy. They're catchy memes. Um, and another idea about the evolution of the God concept is that it's, it's evolved culturally over the ages just to be very, very appealing to us and to be, to be in effect, a catchy meme. And Sometimes it's good for us, sometimes it's not, and that, that's true of religious ideas in general, um, but they stick around not necessarily because they're good for us or for our groups, uh, but just because they're good for themselves and that they stick in our minds and they stick around in the culture. So so humans invented God, not the other way around. Yeah, and not in the sense that somebody sat down and, and made it up, but just in the sense that it uh, kind of uh, just, just evolved culturally in our species. So do you think do you think that this was just to determine for groups larger than a hundred people that where they didn't know each other it was a better way to determine morality like how to keep people yeah. in control? Yeah, yeah, exactly. And you do see that like it's not the only way to do it. And you can have moral systems that are that are secular, and and they seem to work quite well as well. You can have you know CCTV cameras and uh, you know policing of society, uh, and where that kind of thing comes along. Sometimes uh, religious belief seems to decline, uh, maybe because it's no longer needed as much. Okay. Okay. So, I mean, when you were when you were doing the research for the book and when you were putting it together, were, were you looking at the scope of where we've been and where we are now? Like, how did you how did you assign the role of technology and where the future is right now? Um. Yeah, so Connecting look a little through bit. social media, I mean, the yeah, stuff yeah, that's yeah. changed our culture recently. Well, I can tell you, we're, we're in a stage at the moment where things are changing very, very fast, right? Um, and I didn't actually say too much about that. At the, at the end of the book, I touched briefly on where we are now and where we're headed. And I actually, I, collect, I was planning to say quite a bit on that topic, collected a whole bunch of notes. And in the end, I just thought, oh, man, look, this is just, it's just so hard to predict where we're going. And I, I don't actually know where we're going. And... So I, I, in the end, decided that the wise move would be not to say too much about where we're going in the future, except to say just a few things. One is that we are certainly gaining more and more power over the planet and over ourselves and over the, the future of the Earth. So whatever happens, uh, it's probably going to be a big deal. We need to be, you know, hopefully we're not going to destroy ourselves. I tend to be optimistic. I think probably we, we're going to, um, probably we're going to do all right. Um but either way, we are more and more getting into the driver's seat uh, of the planet as a whole. Mm-hmm. Okay. Uh, one wo- other thing. Sorry, go ahead. I was going to say one other thing is that social media, I think, is really going to accelerate the process of cultural evolution because it makes it so much easier for ideas to fly around the place very, very quickly, for bad ideas uh, to spread, but also for bad ideas to be debunked. So for better or worse, it's, it's all accelerating and going much faster. I mean, it sounds like a very optimistic view of where the world is headed. I mean, it's considering the environment crisis. I mean, it. Yep. So, so you're presuming that 
you know, the, the species is going to continue evolving, continue expanding, culture is going to continue changing, and we're going to survive. And that's the assumption. Um, I wouldn't say it's an assumption. If I had to guess one way or the other, that's, that's the way I would guess. But I certainly, like, I'm not like hyper optimistic. I certainly think that it's possible <laughs> that we're going to mess everything up, mess up the planet. Okay, a little bit off track here. I'm going to get back on track now. <laughs> yeah. you, you talk about altruism quite a bit. Your alien scientist, he's yeah. trying to understand the concept of being altruistic. Let's, let's define altruism first. Sure. Well, uh, altruism, the way that biologists look at it, is it's any act that helps another individual at a cost to the altruist. Um, and it's usually defined in terms of uh, helping the other individual in terms of survival, reproductive success, at a cost to the survival and reproductive success of the person engaged in the altruistic behavior. And the reason this is such a focus, it's really, I think, one of the most fascinating areas within evolutionary biology. And the reason is that at first glance, when you first hear about evolutionary theory, you might not expect us to evolve to be altruistic at all. You might think, okay, well, uh, what I've heard is that evolutionary theory is all about the survival of the fittest. Presumably that means that you're going to get selection for individuals that just look out for number one and couldn't care less about anybody else. And they try to elbow everybody else out of the way. So you get selection for the sharpest of elbows and just the meanest people. And, you know, you certainly do get some of that. There's plenty of selfishness and human beings, plenty of human uh, uh, selfishness right throughout the animal kingdom. Hmm. But the funny thing, the strange thing, and this is something that I think would puzzle our, our alien scientist, is that as well as that, you do also get a surprising amount of kindness and altruism and, and caring for other individuals. It's especially common among among relatives. Well, please continue. I mean, um, sure. you, 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 when when you're looking at altruism, are you are you suggesting that, you know, there's I think you said this. I mean, there's there's a price. Do you think that serving yourself would go further genetically? Uh, in some circumstances, it does. But in some circumstances, uh, it doesn't. It, it actually is uh, better for the, the genes of the individual altruist to, to be altruistic in certain circumstances. So yeah, the, the main one and the one that you can see just right throughout the, the living world uh, is altruism toward genetic relatives. And the basic idea is that uh, organisms share more genes with their relatives than they do with anybody else on the planet. And as a result of that, any gene that, that comes along that helps lead to the development of a tendency to help one's genetic relatives, well, that gene can spread just because that gene uh, is more likely than chance to be found in those very uh, relatives. Mm -hmm. In other words, in the recipients of the help. So uh, that's called kin selection. And okay. it's a very, very powerful force uh, in, in nature. You find it not only in humans. So you do find it in humans and you find it right across cultures, et cetera. But you also find it uh, in many other species as well. And in, in, in birds, you find it in um, uh, uh, like, like honeybees and ants. In fact, it's not even just limited to animals. You find it in plants as well. Uh, you find it in bacteria, viruses even. It's just this very, very deep trend right throughout the, the natural world. Wow, that's totally fascinating. So, so okay. So you're saying that altruism is just a gene, and it's edited in or out based on how you know well it does, like how, how natural selection. Yeah. So, um, it's, it's probably not one gene, but like many, many genes. So most complex traits um, are a product of thousands or tens of thousands um, of of separate genes all interacting. But yeah, altruism in some cases can be a product of I guess what you call genetic self-interest. So the, the individual organism is behaving non-selfishly and that they're helping another individual. Um, but the genes giving rise to that trait, they're actually keeping themselves afloat in the gene pool because of the effects that they have on individual, basically on, on copies of themselves and other individuals. Hmm. Okay, so I mean, clearly the human is more nuanced culturally than, say, a whale or a turtle even you know like we yeah. Yeah. we see we seem to have these trends in music and fashion how did you equate those to the relationship to natural selection does it relate at all to the, the advancement yeah. of evolution yeah i think it does in, in two ways uh first of all let me say i completely agree that culturally we're, we're in just a completely different league than any other species, completely different than whales and chimpanzees and you know all these other species. They do actually have some degree of culture, so they can make up uh, different ways to to make a living or to extract food. Whales have different whale songs, and and they spread among the group culturally. 
Um, but we've taken that to a whole new league, right? We, we just are completely out of this world compared to other species. Sure. Now, natural selection, I think, ties in with that in two ways. One is that natural selection gave us the capacity for culture in the first place. So I think what must have happened is that somewhere on, along the line, we, we were less intelligent. We had less of a cultural capacity. But we, we started, we, we maybe had the level of culture you find in chimpanzees. And so we started making up these clever little tricks um, for how to get food, how to process food, and so on, uh, shelter, clothing, that kind of thing. Once we had a stockpile of those kind of cultural items, it then became useful. They, they were so useful that individuals who could pick them up more quickly they did better. So you would have selection of a greater intelligence, a greater ability to copy other individuals and pick up the culture. Um, and because they, they did better, they had more offspring, and that tendency increased. We, we became more and more of a, of a smart cultural animal. Uh, we then invented even more clever culture, which increased the level of selection for uh, being, being a smart cultural animal, and so on and so on. So that's how the, the cultural capacity evolved. But then once it did evolve, it's, it's like a really open-ended kind of system. So if you can learn one thing, you can learn hundreds of other things. And because it's open-ended, that meant that it, to some degree it came off the genetic leash and culture started evolving in its own right by itself, independently of our biology. And at, at that point, natural selection zooms in and starts selecting from among different means, different cultural uh, elements. So if you have a whole bunch of different uh, tunes, for instance, a bunch of different songs, the ones that are going to stick in people's minds better, they're the ones that people are going to remember more. They're going to they're going to hum them. They're going to sing them. The song is going to spread better. And so you get a, a cultural selection pressure for the catchiest songs, the most pleasant songs, the ones that people like the most, or, or at least in the case of airworms, the ones that they can't get out of their heads, even if they don't like them. Mm. And the same applies to art. The same applies to stories. You, you would get selection for more and more riveting stories, uh, more and more riveting uh, movies and TV, um, partly because people are trying to make up riveting movies and riveting TV shows and trying to make up good songs. But it's also natural selection gets in there as well and has an independent effect just because, um, you know, I might want to write the greatest song or make the greatest piece of art, but I can't just do that just because I want to. And so you have to have selection among the many, many different variants that people come out with. Um, uh, and that guides the, the evolution of culture as well. So you, you call this the memes eye view of cultural evolution? Is that the way you call it? or? That, yes, that is. That's right. That, um, okay. So And that traces back to an idea from Richard Dawkins. Basically, so, so the genes eye view of evolution, that's the idea we were, we were talking about earlier. Basic idea there is that the genes that get selected are genes that have effects on, on their owners that cause those genes to stay in the gene pool. So, so making sharper teeth, faster legs, uh, a motivation to, to eat when you're hungry, et cetera. Um, the, the, the memes I view, on the other hand, that's the idea that the memes that are selected are the ones that have effects on the people who encounter them that cause them to act in ways that keep those memes in the culture. So, uh, you know, the better, better stories, catchier tunes, um, all those kind of things. Ideas that motivate people to that they want to um, talk about these, talk about certain ideas. They want to pass them on. They want to impose them on other people. Those are the memes that are going to do better. Memes that have less of those effects, they're going to disappear out of the culture. So natural selection on memes. Hmm. So like the tide challenge. I mean, that's a form of natural selection. Yeah, yeah. Um, the, the tide pod challenge, right? So that was, was that, that a year or so ago, maybe a couple of years sure. ago. Um, a bunch of uh, teenagers in particular were, had this challenge where they would eat a Tide Pod. Um, <laughs> not a good idea, right? And, and that actually, that raises a, quite a big question. It's, it's another, something else that the alien would be very, very mystified by, is that we do often engage in this really weird behavior that doesn't seem to be adaptive. It actually looks, things like that, they actually look like they're really maladaptive. And the question that for an evolutionist is, okay, so we do this stuff. How could it be adaptive? And I think the answer is that it's not adaptive at all. Okay? It, it is actually as maladaptive as it looks. And I think, so, so then the question is, so why do we do this maladaptive stuff? That would really puzzle the alien. Mm -hmm. I think the reason is that although those particular behaviors and, and weird challenges, although those are maladaptive, the psychological processes that make them possible, uh, those are very adaptive in general. 
So those processes are the ones we've been talking about in terms of our, our intelligence, our ability to learn from each other, our cultural capacity, and, and maybe most importantly, just our, simply our ability to copy each other. Now, I think there's a good case to be made that those um, are part of human nature, they're products of evolution, and they would only have evolved if they were very, very useful for us in the past on average. Hmm. But for a trait to be selected, it doesn't have to be useful 100% of the time. It only has to be useful on average. And because our cultural, our cultural capacity is so open-ended, uh, when, when it evolved, it just made us vulnerable to learning maladaptive means as well as uh, learning adaptive ones. Wow. I mean, it's truly fascinating. It's really interesting how it all works. I mean, it, what you talk a little bit about um, like prestige bias and conformity bias. Can we define those two things, please? Yeah, sure. So the prestige bias. So, so I guess uh, first thing to say would be that we're really, really good at learning, but we don't just learn anything at all. We're really, really good at copying each other, but we don't just copy anything or anyone. We have certain kind of biases that generally lead us to uh, acquire adaptive means. One of those is the prestige bias, and that is uh, the fact that we tend to copy and learn from individuals who are high in status and prestige more than we do people who are low in status and prestige. And it makes sense, right? If you're going to be copying memes, you're more likely to get a useful one if you copy a successful person than if you copy an unsuccessful person. The conformity bias, on the other hand, that refers to the fact that we tend to copy memes and cultural you know, ideas that are common in the culture rather than those that are rare. And again, that makes good adaptive sense because uh, memes that have become common are more likely to be useful than, than rare ones. And so it's better to copy those memes than to, to go it alone or to copy memes that very, very few, few people hold. Now, both those cases, they tend to lead us toward uh, adaptive ideas and memes and ways to, to make a living. Uh, they don't always, though. So the prestige bias, for instance, if we're copying high status people, that's a good rule of thumb. But the thing is that we, we don't just copy the things that made that person high in status. We copy lots of stuff and we often we will copy irrelevant things as well. So one example would be uh, like say say a teenager uh, copying a favorite rock star mm -hmm. uh, copies not only the things that made that rock star a success but also uh you know their debauched lifestyle and, and their drug habit and and whatever else copying those things too so yeah prestige bias usually useful but not always it's really interesting it makes a lot of sense i mean it seems like then culture itself could edit out you know the behavior that it wants it us yeah. to i mean we so if we're copying smarter people it would lead to longer lifespan if we're copying dumber people then you die exactly and when you die you take uh those memes to the grave with you and they're less available for other people to copy so you just sort of you get this automatic editing out of of maladaptive memes to some degree and and the worst the memes are the the, the more maladaptive they are the more likely they are to edit themselves out of the, the uh, culture so what it, is this what the term cumulative culture would be? Yes, yeah, so that relates very closely to that. So cumulative culture refers to the fact that I think it's probably the real success, um, the real secret of our, our success as a species. And it refers to the fact that not only do we have culture, but we have the ability to stockpile culture and to add to the common pool of, of ideas and discoveries and technologies. Uh, add, add to those to the pool over time, and then we can tinker with them and improve them a little bit and then improve them a little more in the next generation. And what that means is that we we have science and we have technology that no individual, the, the greatest genius in history could never have invented these things by himself or herself um, just because um, they have, they've come about through a very, very slow ratcheting up a progression where uh, we're passing these ideas down through the generations and improving them slowly but surely over the course of the generations. And that means that we can, uh, f well, I'll tell you my favorite example. So if you think about Plato and Aristotle, so Plato and Aristotle, among the greatest thinkers of the ancient world, um, they were probably vastly more intelligent than most people living today, right? But most people living today have a vastly more accurate view of the universe than the, the greatest of these, of these ancient thinkers. Um, in fact, even most preschool children have a better understanding of the universe because most preschool children know that we live on a, on a spinning rock that's going around a great big ball of fire. Uh, they know that, they understand that uh, even, even before they go to school often. Um, Plato and Aristotle didn't know that. 
So in a certain sense, uh, preschool children today um, have a more accurate view of uh, of the universe than did than the greatest of the ancient thinkers. Now, that has nothing at all to do with biological evolution. We are basically the same animal that we were back then. It's got everything to do instead with cumulative cultural evolution and our capacity to improve our knowledge over time. Wow, it's really incredible to understand that. I don't think I've thought about that exactly in that way, that a preschool child would have a better understanding of the universe just because of the cultural evolution and the knowledge that we gain as a species as time's, time moves on. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And I think that, it's, it's the real, like I say, the, the real secret of our success. It's quite amazing. So, I mean, what about the idea that you know, technology has made people less intelligent? Uh, technology, because, you know, you're looking at your phone all day and you never have to remember a number. Your, your phone does all the thinking for you. Yeah. What happens there? Well, the... There are very mixed arguments about that. Um, it is true that that does take some of the, the pressure to remember certain things off us, and we no longer have to. But I know that um, Socrates, for instance, he worried about reading for exactly the same reason. He thought that um, if literacy became widespread, that would be a really, really bad thing, and it would make people less clever and corrupt them. They wouldn't have to remember things so much. Um, you know, I think that, that obviously it's actually gone in the reverse direction, and literacy has made us a lot more clever. Um, I think people worried about the same thing uh, right throughout history. And it's possibly just uh, not actually such a problem today as, as people are inclined to think. Um, I mean, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. So I'm not saying there's 100%. But I think one line of evidence that I heard of that I found very, very interesting a few years ago is that, um, you know, people used to worry that if you had calculators in the classroom, kids would get useless at maths because they just wouldn't have to, uh, they, would, they wouldn't have the same demands on their intellect that they used to have. But there's at least some evidence suggesting that it actually goes the other way, that if kids have the calculator to do the basic operations, they kind of freeze up time and it frees up uh, cognitive power for them to think in more depth about more abstract aspects of mathematics and to understand it at actually a deeper level, because, just because this, this little tool is taking some of the pressure off us for the, for the basic stuff. You know, maybe maybe the Internet and social media and all this kind of things, things like that, maybe they'll have the same kind of effect. Hmm. Yeah, you know, yeah, I'm I'm truly fascinated by this work. I mean, it seems you've really done the research. You've really looked at all these things that determine behavior, culture, the evolution of our species. Um, you know, for you, was there something that challenged you the most when you were writing the book? Um, any anything that that you found? I don't, I don't know specifically a hurdle that you had to get past, maybe a gap in information or something like that. I probably, I probably mentioned the biggest one already, which is trying to figure out what's going to happen in the future. Um, and I think by the time I came to write the book, um, with that exception, I had, I basically had most of the material um, in a rough form already, just from having taught it for about 10 years before that. I think for me, probably the, the biggest intellectual challenge came earlier, actually. It was when I first encountered these ideas. Um, and when I first went to university and uh, discovered evolutionary theory, uh, got into philosophy and that kind of thing. Um, so, so I did, like I, I used to be really religious, I used to believe in God and uh, studying philosophy in particular, um, slowly but surely sort of uh, uh, changed that for me. Hmm. Okay. I mean, it, it seems like, I mean, I'm just reading our chat. And it seems like it, it could go in either direction as far as how much people connect or disconnect to your work. So, mm -hmm. you know, how do you do you find that your ideas are controversial in, in any way? Do you find that people attack you for the the, the book? Yeah. Uh, yeah, um, they're somewhat controversial. I think um, so one area that's quite controversial is is the area of sex differences. Um, a lot of folks are not big fans of the idea that we have evolved sex differences. Um, I think that the evidence is very strong that we do. I think I think I do understand where it comes from to some degree. So so I know in the past, right, that there have been lots of um, very sexist claims made supposedly by scientists, you know, in, in the garb of science. Um, in the 1800s, for instance, there was this guy, Gustave Le Bon. Uh, he basically came out and said, 
Well, you know, you do actually find some women who are as intellectually accomplished as, as men, but they're very, very rare. They're as rare, in fact, as uh, a two-headed gorilla or any other kind of monstrosity, which is obviously really, really sexist. Obviously, also, uh, needless to say, not true. Mm. But you can sort of understand when we have skeletons like that in, in our closet that that actually – you can see why people are a bit wary about going down this path of, of looking at sex differences. Sure. Um, I don't think actually that it's a problem, though. I think that most of the sex differences are relatively modest. I think that a lot of them are in areas where, you know, it, they're kind of neutral rather than really, really important things. Important things like intelligence, there, there are no sex differences in that respect. Um, and another thing, a lot of them actually, what the sort of things we talk about in evolutionary psychology, if anything, they put uh, men in a worse light than they put women. So when we're talking about things like um, sex differences in, uh, in, in aggression and violence and things like that, you know, those are bad traits. So they're actually putting men in a worse light than women. Um, and one other thing I'd say about that is that um, I think that for people who worry that these looking at sex differences is going to set back uh, the women's liberation movement. I think that's a mistake. I think that we can we can treat both sexes fairly and respectfully, even if men and women differ on average in certain respects. Okay, and I've, Steve, I've got one question for you. I really appreciate your yep. time tonight with us. Um, you know, something that I noticed about your work is you ultimately ended up with uh, what me, might be called a gloomy conclusion about what life may or may not mean here, which is that life has no meaning, no purpose. And I mean, h how do we connect with this? I mean, it seems like such a depressing idea to yeah. relate to. <laughs> it is. It's a bit of a drag, right? Um, so, so that's from my first book, uh, Darwin, God and the Meaning of Life. Um, and what I say there, I think probably the way I'd want to put it is not that life has no meaning, but rather there's no ultimate meaning to life. So there's no meaning to life that's imposed on us from outside of ourselves. There's no meaning imposed by a god or gods. Um, there's no meaning uh, imprinted into the, the basic fabric, fabric of the universe. Um, and that can certainly be a depressing conclusion for people who have been brought up to think that that is the case, that actually there is an ultimate meaning of life um, over and above our own personal meanings. But I think people pretty quickly get used to the idea. I certainly did. So this is what I was referring to when I was saying one of the big challenges for me. So certainly when I came to that view, I, I did think it was a bit of a drag, but I did, uh, because it is, but I, you know, very quickly we can recalibrate our standards. And I think that actually we do have personal meanings in our lives that we create for ourselves. And I think that as soon as you get used to the fact that there's no God-given or, or universal uh, kind of meaning in life, you can get used to the fact that the meanings uh, that you have in your life are created by yourself. And there is actually, there's a silver lining in that cloud. And that's that it actually gives us a whole bunch more freedom to choose the kind of meanings that we adopt for our lives. Um, we become much more free than we would be if there's some kind of meaning imposed on us from outside. And, you know, it's, it sounds like a gloomy conclusion, but actually I think that life is good and it can be great and we're, we're trying to make it better. And I think we're, we're succeeding in that respect. And I think that's enough. Yeah, I think that's an apt answer. You know, I, I, I really appreciate your work. It, it got me to kind of question my own ideas and really challenge those, which I appreciate it. And usually we go in a different direction on this show so, you know, like I said in, in the pre-show, I, I really wanted to look at the other side of the coin of, you know, yeah. how how does how would an evolutionary scientist look at the way that culture and humans have evolved? Um, you know, I, I think we covered pretty much everything that we could in about an hour. Was there was there anything I want to give you a chance? Was there anything that you wanted to touch on that that we haven't touched on yet? I let me think. I actually think we did quite a good job of covering some of the main things. And actually, I actually, I've got to say, I really, I really enjoyed that. Yeah, me too. Um, so where can people, where can people go and get the book? Where can people find your work? Yeah, I think that the best way to get hold of the book is probably Amazon, um, like globally. If you're in the UK, go to the Cambridge website um, or, or Amazon. But, but if you're not in the UK, Amazon is your best bet. Uh, just Google Ape That Understood the Universe or Google my name. Uh, you you can find me on Twitter is probably the best place to find me uh, in social media. And my Twitter handle is at Steve Stewell. So at S-T-E-V-E-S-T-U-W-I-L-L. -L. 
Sounds good. Dr. Steve, thank you so much for your time. Guys, you heard it here. Thank you. The, the book is called The Ape That Understood the Universe. My guest, his name is Dr. Steve Stewart Williams. If you really want to challenge your thinking and take a different look at some of the stuff that we cover here on HXP, I would recommend the read. I really do. So we're going to get out of here. We'll see you guys next week. Thank you so much for listening. And we are out.